to start with, we, we, you know, we've been talking about decentralization through the day to day. And in some ways, uh, a lot of uh, people have mentioned it in different ways, in, uh, uh, ways whether it was uh, uh, Chuck Shu talking about uh, knowing who to go to for where and having those organograms um, uh, up and ready in place, knowing uh, uh, where, you know, do you go to HR, do you go to marketing, do you go to um, um, uh, sales in a private office similarly like how there is a need in and part of our civic engagement needs to have uh, this this knowledge of uh, what happens at what level of government and so so bringing some of those conversation back in and and uh, you know we, we're going to sort of start through our uh, uh, presentation today take you through a little bit of what decentralized governance looks like in uh, India. But one of the most critical prerequisites to, uh, to understanding decentralization and, and this form of governance uh, uh, is, is to really first understand the concept of uh, decentralization and to be able to better envision what decentralization really means. So how best can it be planned and implemented? What, is, what are its intricacies? How are its challenges? How its challenges can be overcome? What do we need to be equipped with um, uh, what tools do we need to be equipped with uh, to, to, you know, um, be able to, to look at it from an analytical lens, but also be able to simultaneously view it from a social lens and, and a real standpoint and, and see whether theory meets practice. Um, and, and so it always helps to have theory and practice go together. So to start today, I'm going to talk a little bit about decentralization and what that concept really means. And to me, it's a really, really simple concept, right? Uh, and, and I'll try and put it as simply as possible. There are many definitions around uh, and, and we can go as, we can make it as complicated as we want and there's merit to that as well, but, but we'll keep it simple for, for our uh, conversation today. So to me, it's very simple. Uh, it, decentralization rests on the premise that each level of government, namely the union, state and local government has their own very, very own co comparative advantage over the other. Uh, doing in, in doing certain tasks, right? So in operative terms, it really means that there are certain tasks that are best performed at a higher level, uh, just because of their proximity and vantage points, some at a, a lower level than that, and some probably at the most local level. Um, and given their vantage positions include the capacities and resources and the financial uh, the, and non-financial uh, um, uh, resources that they have access to. Uh, so really, it's, it's, it's about uh, figuring out what is the comparative advantage of each level of government and therefore deciding what the relationship between these governments, uh, levels of governments should be. Um, so a simple, uh, uh, so it should be noted on the outset that it's not, uh, um, a decentralization is not just a theory. It's not something that, that, you know, we've just picked up from theory and we're talking about today. It is actually a diverse practice adopted by many countries in varying degrees. And uh, it, does, uh, it does form a way for us to be governed uh, uh, and services to be delivered and, uh, uh, and public sector uh, reforms happen through this way of governance and through this mode of governance. So I think one simple way of understanding decentralization is this definition that I've got uh, up over here, which is decentralization is the transfer of political, administrative, and fiscal responsibilities to, elect, to locally elected bodies in urban and rural areas, and the empowerment of communities to exert control over these bodies. And that's really important, right? So three key terms actually stand out from this, which is the transfer of political, administrative, and fiscal responsibilities to subnational or local bodies. So uh, transferring that power from the center to either the state or the union to the state uh, or the local governments, right? Um, so political decentralization essentially is the transfer of political power and decision-making authority uh, to subnational governments, like I said. This basically means getting, it could mean having constitutional rights. It could mean, um, uh, it could mean having uh, um, um, uh, rules and regulations and framework in place that actually transfer this authority politically. Uh, administrative decentralization involves the transfer of decision-making authority, resources and responsibilities for the delivery of public services from the central level to the local governments, right? So it is about having administrative power and functionaries uh, and, and them, they having the power at the local and the, uh, and the sub-national levels to actually, um, um, to actually be able to take decisions, 
right? Because it's not just that the power has been given. Actually, administrative administrators at different levels of government also have control. Uh, so that, and then there's fiscal decentralization, which actually involves a level of resource reallocation from uh, or uh, from the central or the state government. So the union in the case of India. Um, to local governments or to uh, lower levels of governments and, and in a way that uh, the, the work that has been allotted to uh, the political uh, decentralization that has, uh, that has happened or the work that has been allotted to the lower levels of government uh, are, um, um, uh, are um, uh, and they have, they have the funds and the, uh, the, the required resources to actually complete them. And so this is one way of thinking about it. The other way of thinking about it is just remembering these three words. And I won't go into detail, but the three Fs of decentralization, which is functions, so the work that is assigned, the responsibility that is assigned, the funds, that is the funds, once the responsibility has been decide, uh, assigned, then are the funds available? And the third, functionaries, that once the... Uh, uh, you know, once the functions and the funds are there, are there functionaries who have the capacity uh, or is there capacity at the local level to actually, uh, or at subnational levels to actually uh, complete the work? Uh, so what does this look like in the Indian context? And we'll quickly talk about some of the, so India, like you all know, um, uh, decentralized uh, in 93, like uh, uh, Chakshu and um, um, Srikant was saying in the previous session, how it, it's been an afterthought in some ways. Uh, and um, and uh, so um, um, so 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 what what it looks like in India today, and I'll quickly give you a snippet of what it looks like in India today. Moving to the next, uh, so we can move to the next session. Um, so India has the union government, uh, three tier st structure with the union, the state, and the local government. The local governments have different urban and rural structures. So like you've seen, uh, the 93rd and the 94th amendment uh, brought, uh, gave uh, constitutional status to our panchayats and urban local bodies. And so within the rural structure, you have the panchayat, uh, within the, you have the panchayati raj, the zilla parishad panchayat samiti and the village panchayat. And then uh, in the urban setup, you've got municipal corporations, municipalities, city councils and wards. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be under each other in the urban section. It depends also on population. Uh, but these are typically the bodies that you will find uh, in the at the local level. Uh, then there's something called as horizontally decentralization also, right? The structure of the Indian government was created in a way that we don't just have the union and the center and the state, but we also have very many different bodies that actually um, allow us to, uh, uh, you know, that also play a role in government, governing things. And so without spending too much time, of course, you all know we've got the legislative a judiciary and executive, but we've also got within the executive uh, a political uh, uh, executive. We've got the ministries, which have got the secretariats and the line departments. We've also got um, parastatals, uh, so statutory and autonomous bodies there. We've got, uh, uh, you know, the PSUs that have been in the news so much, so the corporates. We've also got think tanks uh, um, like the Niti Aayog. Um, we've also got regulators like the RBI and other regulators. One might argue that maybe regulators shouldn't be part of this executive, but what I wanted to point out over here is, um, is altogether there are many different bodies and there is a largely decentralized structure. So there's decentralization of power that actually works in different bits and pieces and its own ways uh, to govern, um, uh, govern the country, so to speak. Uh, okay. So, so all so like there is a, there is a union list, a concurrent list, and a state list, and this is where you will find what functions have been allotted to the different uh, uh, to the uh, to the different um, uh, levels of the government, and each of them have been given functions that. Uh, um, uh, and the union has the function that the union has been given. The state has got the functions that the state has been given. Concurrent is what they have both together, and simultaneously the panchayati raj has also been given some functions. So uh, that. And the third is that every level of government also has its own taxation powers. Of course, these have changed with GST coming into play, but it is important to remember that these taxation, that every that every level has been given certain powers to raise its own revenues. And, and for the rest of it, it relies on uh, transfers made from higher levels of government. So uh, there are taxation powers. And now but the last thing that I want to leave you with is a quick a checklist of sorts that you can remember 
when you start thinking about and studying and going into a department and thinking about what, to what extent has decentralization actually happened in our country so how politically fiscally administratively have we decentralized and to what extent and these indicators will help you actually uh, understand and unravel um, and disentangle this world of um, decentralized governance in india so so things to remember um, is there clear role assignment for the people uh, do do uh, whenever the funds have, whenever the function has been given the responsibility has been given does that level of government or does that person have the power to spend that money how much power do we have for taxation is there discretion in spending the money so am i getting the money and can i spend it as per my needs on the local at the local level um do i have the power high, uh, to fire fire and control the staff and where is the direct accountability lie am i directly accountable to the people or who am i accountable to above me so these are these are questions to slew and think about and similarly also there are other things to see right uh, is there scheme bound expenditure uh, are there limited powers to collect resources um, um is somebody else acting on behalf of me Uh, is somebody else act, act, taking decisions on behalf of the local government? Is the local government, and when I say local government, I of course mean the Panchayati Raj Department, but I also mean local level of governance and our uh, um, uh, line departments uh, at the local level as well. So these are some things that I want you to remember as we move forward. And I'm going to now pass this uh, on to my colleague uh, Sanjana, who will take you through an example that we can then disentangle. um decentralization through together so this was just to build a bit of context so sanjana over to you yeah thanks rajika yeah. all right like rajika said let's try to detangle this whole system of decentralization through the perspective of a non governmental organization say they want to work alongside the government so to do this they need to know who does what at what level they do it and why it's important that they're doing what they're doing so we're going to take the experiences of an ngo and before that let me just show you a quick um snapshot of the nutrition delivery system and so um so india's nutrition delivery system right now is mainly delivered through the poshan abhiyan which includes a big umbrella of different uh, direct and indirect interventions that are all aiming to improve the nutritional status of both women and children So this portion of beyond really emphasizes the importance of these various different departments that you can see in all these different colors on this map for all of them to work together. I know that this map is like really detailed and complex, and there are many arrows going across the whole thing, and it's kind of hard to decipher it all at once. But uh, don't worry about that. Like my intention uh, in showing this to you is to just give you a sense of the diversity of the different levels of the government that are involved in actually executing a function and to help a service actually reach the citizen so if you want to see the levels of governance if you look at the extreme left uh, of the map you can see the different levels listed the union state um division district block village and these are some of the you can relate this to what uh, rajika had also gone through um so this particular map that we've made it's uh, based on our understanding of the nutrition delivery system in rajasthan and but this doesn't capture the entire gamut of the nutrition delivery universe and everything that comes under poshan abhiyan it just focuses on the integrated child development services that are commonly known as icds and which is primarily delivered through the department of women and child development so the vertical set of rectangles that you can see in gray um that represents the department of women and child development and then we're also looking at the health department which is in yellow um that delivers uh, again like associated nutrition related services like infant immunizations and antenatal care uh for for pregnant women so let's just keep this in mind i know it's really hard to get lost in this entire web but let's try to keep this in mind and we'll go forward and try to detangle and understand how a non governmental organization from the outside can try to navigate this entire thing so Let's imagine that you are a large civil society organization and you want to uh, approach the government and implement a nutrition program. So let's call this uh, imaginary civil society organization uh, ABC Impact. Let's just uh, go with that name. So let's say they want to implement their program in two districts in one state. Let's take Rajasthan since we're already talking about it. and uh, you know they want to pitch a program to the government to say that they want to build capacity for frontline workers you know these were the ones that were just at the very bottom of the map that i showed you 
uh, the ones that are just above the beneficiaries. And these are the ones who are critical to making sure that the government services actually reach the citizens. So the CSO is capacity building program, you know, ABC Impact, what they're pitching. They're saying that nutrition frontline workers should learn how to improve the quality of their services, improve coordination, learn how to set up monitoring and review processes, and most importantly, learn how to better engage uh, with citizens and then try to create demand for the nutrition related services that they're trying to deliver. So we're not gonna go into how and why the CSO ABC Impact is going to implement their program, but we'll rather focus on their experience of actually engaging with this decentralized state from the outside. And we're going to use the nutrition map that I showed you to see how they will go about navigating this and then also understand the potential challenges um, that they can face while they're doing so. So let's just go in with the first step and the first challenge that they encounter. So, you know, what, when they're planning to do this entire thing, they're like, okay, let's uh, pilot the intervention that we have in mind. So, you know, they, their intervention includes the frontline workers, the last mile of delivery, and there's going to be some interaction between the frontline workers and the beneficiaries. So they need to figure out like, what is the ideal place for them to start and uh, implement a small scale pilot? Um, so let's just get a sense of what all of you think uh, and see where they should start. Um, Ridula, can you launch the poll, please? So we just have a quick poll. Um, so you can also put in your ideas of where you think, who you think they should approach um, to start their uh, pilot program. Yeah, in case any of you are wondering about my background, that's the inside of a government office. And I know we're doing this virtually, but I just wanted to give a sense of what it's like to be inside a government office. And this one's actually a Gram Panchayat one. So relates perfectly to where everyone thinks we should be going next. Great, everyone thinks we should, majority of people think we should be going to the Gram Panchayat level. So let's see now what ABC Impact did and how they approached this problem. So ABC Impact, it's a large organization. They've been doing this kind of work for some time, but maybe not necessarily in nutrition. So they had done a previous project on school management committees. And they learned that doing a pilot is not just important for them to understand the context that they're working in and to really see how, whether they need to make any changes in their intervention, but also to demonstrate to the government offices that they will be partnering with, that they have experience and they have hands-on knowledge to really see how to work with the government and then how to cement. And this really helps when they need to cement this partnership. So I personally actually experienced the same thing of like trying to set up a pilot and like set up this partnership with the government. When I was working in Rajasthan on trying to implement a wearable health technology related intervention. So uh, I actually, unlike all of you, majority of you thought that the best place to start would be to go to the district collector. You know, I know that this person has a fair amount, a good amount of authority. And if I pitch my a pilot project to them and I get the buy-in from the district collector, you know, I'll be, I'll be good to go. And I already had like a large amount of funding from big donors. I had several support letters from different organizations. Um, you know, I'd got awards to say, okay, great. This is a great intervention. It has great potential. And I go to the district collector and I pitch it to, to him. And uh, the collector in the place that I was working in was an engineer. He was super excited about this wearable technology. And we were all having a great conversation. He was very excited to see uh, how, you know, all of this would be rolled out. And I, I was internally thinking like, great, like this is done. My pilot's good to go. But then the collector suddenly asked me, okay, can I see the results from your pilot? Now I got super confused when I heard this because I just thought that I had approached him in order to implement the pilot in the first place. But it turns out that he actually wanted to see results of a previous pilot to show that I actually knew what I was talking about. So he wanted to see a pilot before he could give approval for this new pilot. Um, so now we know that like you can't just go to the government without having anything, any groundwork and any experience, uh, you know, in your hand. And the DC also may not be the best person to just start with, without any experience. The first, you know, may not necessarily be the best first point of contact that we have. So um, and this is something that you'll see as we go on to the subsequent challenges that ABC Impact faces that, yeah, there is a need to interact with uh, officers who have a lot of power, like the district collector. But since these, since some officers like the district collector are always being pulled in like a variety of directions, it may be better to choose someone more strategically and keep in mind where their authority is and uh, see whether, you know, a district collector, where that person positions, uh, you know, a post as the linchpin of the district can be more beneficial. 
And um, there was something that Professor Anuradha Joshi had said in the second panel uh, earlier today that fits exactly with what I'm trying to convey here. So she said, don't knock on the wrong door. If you do so, you're losing your credibility with the individual. And that's exactly what the mistake that I made. I went straight to the DC without actually having implemented anything on the ground. So, you know, understanding how the system works and who to approach also helps in generating credibility and interest in the, your own work that you're trying to pitch. And in the particular case of the district collector, the DC, our own work at AI has shown that understanding the, not just the way the system works, but also the historical context of the institution is quite important. So this DC is not just operating, I know he's very powerful, but he's not just operating as an individual. There's an entire administrative machinery behind this person that is often quite burdened. So there's also a capacity problem that's going on at the same time. And the reasons for this capacity problem can range from vacancies uh, to lack of adequate skills to cases even where a bureaucrat may have been transferred to another department and then just never got transferred back. Um, I mean, deputed. Um, and this is not just the case with the DC. You know, there are other officers uh, who play sort of this coordinating role, like the block development officer. And, uh, you know, work by other researchers has shown that they also similarly face like a huge administrative burden that impacts their day to day working. Um, so let's come back to the question of who should ABC Impact go to? I know that most of you said the Gram Panchayat. And, uh, AI's work on the frontline functionaries in the nutrition sector also shows something similar, but perhaps going to a level higher, the child development and protection officer, the CDPO, who you can see in gray, um, perhaps that might be a better person, um, you know, to conduct this local level exercise. And I'm thinking about this because um, the CDPO is the key functionary in charge of the nutrition and child welfare related matters at the block level. And if you look at the various lines on this map that head towards the CDPO, they're both reporting lines and coordinating lines. And you can actually see that rather than uh, some, you know, like rather than going directly to the Gram Panchayat, which is on the extreme left, the CDPO may be a more uh, useful person to approach because they have, they're entrenched in this entire web and occupy quite a significant position within it. Um, now let's look below at the people that the come below the CDPO and the arrows that are heading away from the CDPO. Um, and if you look at these frontline functionaries, you'll get a sense of who we need to approach when we're actually trying to implement this capacity building pilot. Um, but once you look at the frontline functionaries and you look up, like where do these arrows, where are the arrows actually coming from? You see that the lines lead from both the ICDS department, the WCD department in the dark gray, and in the health department uh, in yellow. So this is a particular case of Rajasthan where you can see the Asha worker who's getting these things, who's just kind of like stuck between the two. She's uh, not in the yellow health department and not in the gray uh, IC de ICDS department either. So, you know, this person is really just stuck and like confused about what to do. And this is something that we'll come back to later as we talk more about ABC Impact's experience of trying to engage with the state. Uh, but another thing that I want you to note is that this is not so across all states. So in Rajasthan, the ASHA worker is stuck between these two departments, but that's not necessarily so in other states. So that doesn't happen, for example, in Bihar. So even when you know how these three Fs are working and how they're decentralized in one state, it doesn't mean that you can just pick up that learning and implement it in another. Um, this is because also the states have the discretion on how they want to decentralize. And also just because it's been done on paper doesn't mean that it's actually being done in reality. Um, and this also ties into a point that Nikhil Day brought up again earlier in the day that, you know, if you actually look at the system and you go on the ground, there's actually a variety of functionaries that you can engage with. You know, you could uh, engage with the, any one of these people at the bottom layer, anyone who's associated with the Gram Panchayat. But, uh, and, you know, he had taken the example of a Narega work site and said that you can approach any one of them. But what you really need to be able to figure out is which one of these engagements will actually be meaningful towards your larger objective. Okay, let's go on to the second challenge that ABC Impact faces. Say they've completed their pilot and now they're ready to, you know, go back to the government and try to implement this on a slightly larger scale. And they want to go to the government and get approval. Uh, to start actually implementing their program. So now who do they actually go to for approval or the, whatever permission they need? So on one hand, it makes sense to go to the highest possible authority. 
Um, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean that this highest, the letter from this highest authority will actually carry weight all the way down to the lowest levels of the government's government uh, structure. I, you know, if you think about the three Fs that uh, Rajika talked about, and you keep this decentralization in mind, um, and she also mentioned like various subjects that have been decentralized to various levels. If you keep that in mind, and you also know that ABC Impact is looking at going to two districts in one state, who do you think they should approach? Um, so we'll quickly do another poll here to get a sense of where they should be going. All right. Um, so people think district level. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's talk to the let's talk through the various options people have picked. All right. So my first question when I was saying like, should they go to the highest level was thinking like, okay, should they go to the Ministry of Child Development, right? Like imagine it's coming from the secretary or the minister over there. Of course, everyone would have to listen when it's coming with that much weight. But the other question is like, okay, it is being implemented by the state. Uh, and you know, we, we know about the union state and concurrent lists. And if nutrition is considered a public health activity, it falls under the state list. So, you know, should they go to the center of the state? That's one dilemma. But uh, we and we know that the portion of beyond is actually funded and like directed and everything by the union government, but it's being implemented by the state government. So that's that's one dilemma. But everyone else seems to think from your results uh, that you should go to the district level. So let's think once about the various activities that are included um, in the nutrition related services. Right? There are uh, take home some examples are take home rations. Uh, hot cooked meals that are delivered through the integrated uh, child development services, ICDS uh, scheme. And this too is primarily financed and directed by the union government as a centrally sponsored scheme, but it's implemented by the states. Um, and since the state is the implementing authority, like my, my thinking is that why shouldn't ABC Impact just approach the state, right? They're already, they're just going to go to one state and they're going to do two districts there. So maybe it makes sense for them to just approach the state level for, for permission. But on the other hand, a majority of you are suggesting that they should just go to the district. But remember to keep in mind that there are two districts that they're trying to approach. So, you know, do they go to one and then later go to the other? Do they go simultaneously uh, to both of them? So ABC Impact also thought exactly the way that you did. And they reached out to the two districts that they had selected and they set up meetings with the two district collectors. And um, what ABC Impact then experienced was a lot like what I experienced, the experience that I had shared previously about the interaction with the DC. So they go to the DC and now they've done a pilot and they show the results and they ask for permission uh, to go ahead and like launch a larger program. So the DC is like, great, like this is an excellent program and it would be great to see this launched. But he said that, um, but I'm not the best person to actually give you this permission. So the DC explains that while he does have enough power to push this proposal through and start implementing the program that ABC Impact is suggesting, it's actually challenging to do so in a sector like nutrition at the district level, because not only is the implementation actually taking place through a line department, so these vertical differently colored uh, sets that you see, um, so not only is it taking place through a line department, that's through the ICDS scheme and the health department, but the entire nutrition machinery at this current time is also working almost on a mission mode towards this portion of beyond, which has all these targets listed, right? So everyone in this thing, they're not, they're waiting and they have targets set from the top going down to the bottom, telling them what they need to execute and at what pace. So this DC trying to step in in the middle of all of this may actually start to pull um, the nutrition related functionaries in another direction. So the DC, you know, basically ends and tells them that I'm sorry, like I'm not the best person to do this, particularly for nutrition, given the way that it's being implemented. So the ABC team gets quite disheartened and they take a step back and they decide to strategize um, how should they go ahead and like how should they get their project back on, back on track. So this time they take a step back and they look at the various different departments that are involved in nutrition delivery and they realize that in this case, and, and you know, echoing exactly what the DC said, the line departments um, seem to be where the power lies and have the executing authority in the case of this, in the middle midst of this portion of beyond. So they decide to go to the ICDS directorate up at the state level and to get approval there, right? So 
this ends the story of how ABC Impact gets approval for their project. Now let's go on to the next challenge. Now they've got approval from the ICDS and um, now they can take this uh, approval letter that they've got from the state level and the state can to a significant extent like direct uh, what the districts are working on. And so they come back with this letter and they start setting up their capacity building program. Um, so now with this letter, they go to the district head of the ICDS and they tell this person, okay, let's uh, conduct our first capacity building session. Uh, let's make sure that all three functionaries at the front line, the Anganwadi worker, the ASHA worker, and the a and uh, let's make sure they all come to this training together since they all work so closely together and let's do this training. So the day of the training comes and unfortunately, only the Anganwadi workers show up. There's no sign of the ASHA workers or the a &Ms. So once again, ABC Impact is facing yet another challenge with trying to actually take this capacity building program ahead. Um, so let's let's go back to our organogram and try to see why this could have happened. You know, why have only the Anganwadi workers shown up and not the Ashas and the AMs? So, you know, they call up an Asha worker that they reached out to during the pilot and say, why, why weren't you present? You know, like why, why didn't you show up for this training? And the Asha and the AMs tell them, well, you know, I didn't get a letter from the health department. That's the department that I report to. And if they're not telling me to come to this, why should I do it? So ABC Impact again then realizes that you know, they all work on nutrition related functions, but they're actually in reality reporting to different departments. And this experience for them really highlighted that it's important not just to think about what level of bureaucracy to get involved, but also through which departments. And it brings in the need to understand horizontal coordination across departments, not this time, not, not the judiciary executive and legislature, but within the executive, the various departments that exist but you also have to think about how is coordination and decentralization now happening across all of them. All right, so now let's imagine that ABC Impact has been able to sort out this coordination challenge and they can go ahead and do their first capacity building workshop. Um, so they're talking to Anganwadi workers and uh, they realize Anganwadi workers share that, you know, one of their main functions is actually trying to take the weight of the various children that come to the Anganwadi center and it's one of their primary functions, but uh, most of them had never actually taken the weight. So the ABC impact team tries to start investigating this and asking them questions about why, why not. And um, they find out that the Anganwadi workers actually do not have weighing machines at all. So forget about like them not having motivation to do their work as most people think of, you know, being lazy or something. It just turns out that they just don't have the weighing machines in the first place, right? They just don't have the resources that they actually need in order to do their job. So ABC Impact, you know, like a typical CSO working from the outside starts thinking about the solutions. They're like, all right, we can, you know, get in touch with this other partner organization of ours. Let's reach out to our funding agency. Let's procure the weighing machines and distribute them. But I mean, let's take a step back here. Now that's not necessarily the most sustainable solution, right? Like as we spoke, as when Rajika went through, like you need all three things. You need funds, functions and functionaries for, for this decentralization to happen in a sustainable and like effective manner. So let's try and see where the root of their problem is, right? So in this case, the Anganwadi worker has been assigned a function, which is taking the weight off of the children, but they don't have the means to be able to do so. So this is one of those cases where a function has been given and they don't have the funds and the means in order to be able to do the job that they've given. So uh, the ABC team finds out that the decision to actually allocate the funding for the weighing machines is taken at the national level, the union level, in the ICDS, uh, the uh, Ministry of Women and Child Development. So while the demand for these weighing machines is actually being generated at the local level, it's traveling up. Um, the demand is traveling up to the union level where the funds are actually being sanctioned. And along the way, this is getting lost. So say, uh, you know, the, the state of Rajasthan raised the demand for 30 weighing machines and eventually only funds for 20 gets approved. So in this case, so something as simple as getting a weighing machine just gets lost and the Anganwadi worker isn't able to perform a fundamental function. So, you know, in reality, like the Anganwadi worker is given thousand rupees per month as this um, untied fund that they can actually use. But this funding hasn't even taken into consideration inflation. You know, it's just been the same thousand rupees for many, many years. 
And on the other hand, like, why why can't we just give the Anganwadi worker a little more funding to just figure out these little things? You know, the Anganwadi workers, when you talk to them, often complain, like, I don't have money to buy my registers that I need for my record keeping. Uh, I have spent so much money on doing uh, photocopies. I need to spend money on maintenance of my center. So, you know, these are cases where the functions have been given to Ang the Anganwadi workers, but they don't actually have the funds in order to actually carry them through. And from the outside, it often seems to us that these functionaries are just lazy. Whereas in reality, it's the case of the funds not being there. All right. Um, so I've talked about the funds and functionaries. Um, let's think about uh, the challenge, say ABC Impact is trying to implement their work right now during the current COVID situation. And what challenge would they face now? So um, AI's work on inside districts um, has shown that frontline workers uh, through this pandemic, pandemic have been super committed to you know, delivering public services. But on the other hand, they're also feeling very bogged down with all of the different demands that are coming their way. So if we're thinking about the example of Rajasthan, the frontline workers right now are taking care of their original duties. Uh, they're taking care of COVID related functions. And they're also right now, Rajasthan is having Gram uh, Sabha uh, election, Gram Panchayat election. So they're also helping to manage all of that. And all of these different tasks and directions that they're getting are coming from different people across different departments. So in Rajasthan, nutrition specifically has been devolved to the Panchayati Raj. And ABC Impact found as they were doing all of this work that the Sarpanch, the block development officer, uh, the Panchayat Secretary, and then at the block level, the Panchayat Samiti, at the district level, the Zilla Parishad, they all have been given monitoring and supervisory powers over all of these nutrition functions. And even most of the orders that come through, they can actually go through any of these other functionaries and levels of governance and Panchayati Raj system as well. And they also play an important role in recruiting the frontline functionaries and, um, you know, in determining the kind of work they do. So they, this, uh, you know, highlights another gap that uh, ABC Impact had kind of missed. They don't have to just get the buy-in of the administrative executive, but also of the political representatives and the political executive. So they needed to identify members in the Panchayati Raj machinery and collaborate with them in order to take their intervention forward, especially say in today, like if the Anganwadi worker is also working on elections, like can they go now and if they've uh, built up a relationship with the Sarpanch and negotiate that once they know the kind of relationship that they have with the Panchayati Raj department. And, uh, um, you know, like I said, like they're reporting to multiple bosses. So here I've highlighted, um, I've highlighted the middle bureaucracy. Right, so here is the level where you can see the various bosses. Now let's look at the experience of these bosses as well, right? I talked about the CDPO um, earlier and uh, the CDPO not only like they're a locus of power, not only are they giving directions, but they're also reporting to a variety of people. So there's the district collector and magistrate, they're so linked to the Zira Parisha, their own line department, they're coordinating with a variety of people. And, uh, they have to coordinate extremely closely with the health department because so many of their functions are so tied together. And uh, often when this happens, this coordination so, sort of get, gets lost in the mix and the functions can't be delivered properly. So this is one of the kind of challenge coordination challenge that uh, functionaries face, especially in the middle bureaucracy. And to add to this different lines of reporting and multiple bosses, there are also like informal power tussles that take place at this middle bureaucracy level. So for example, if you see the block development officer who is in the sort of darker orange pink color on the extreme left. Um, so this block development officer because of decentralization can actually assign tasks to the CDPO. But the CDPO sees himself as an entity that's entirely separate from Panchayati Raj and thinks like, oh, I'm in my own line department and I should not and don't want to be listening to what Panchayati Raj has to say. Um, and every time an order comes from the block development officer, they sort of view it as a digression from the work that they're really supposed to be doing. So similarly, there are also these power tussles and conflicts between the CDPO and the counterpart in the health department, the block medical officer. Um, in this case, the block medical officer sees himself as someone who's more educated and higher up in the hierarchy uh, because they've come out through a tougher recruitment process and they sort of refuse to listen 
to coordination requests so orders that may be coming from the cdpo's end with relation to nutrition so with these examples it shows that the, another thing to sort of be a, uh, in order to really understand how to disentangle democratic decentralization and how it practically works is to understand these various power centers and the conflicts that arise as a result of ill defined hierarchies and like uh, unclear reporting structures and uh, as a result of this there are many like gray areas in the way that decentralized uh, systems actually function on the ground and like i said earlier these differ not just from state to state but also department to department all right let's go on and see um this is my last uh, challenge let's see how imagine abc impact has sort of figured all of this stuff out they've learned how to uh, negotiate through these power tussles how to do horizontal coordination across departments they've got the buy in at various levels and they're they've been implementing this uh, capacity building program um they've been doing so for a year now and now they're thinking all right this is going well how do we start to scale it up and how do we embed it more closely with the government system system so that it can now expand beyond these just these two districts that we've been working in or perhaps even go to other states and uh, this is something that even uh, chakshu roy and shrikant had spoken about in the second panel today you know they talked about how can you build these attitudes for effective government engagement and how can you work like with them alongside the system to make things more sustainable so let's see how abc impact try try to do this and like embed uh, and you know take their program forward so first they went to the highest level they tried to get time with the joint secretary of the ministry of uh, women and child development and they got a meeting they disseminated their report there they made a nice powerpoint presentation they had a good list of recommendations at the end um and and that's it like things just sort of reached a dead end there right they did this presentation they gave the recommendations and now they just don't know what's going to happen and they've been trying to email they've been trying to message and they're just not getting an answer back uh from this joint secretary and they don't know what's going to happen with their program so let's think about what could they have done better you know like how how could they have been smarter in trying to uh make their program more sustainable um if they had known about the funding architecture for nutrition something part of the 3 f's right a big funds is an important part and it's something that ai's research has covered in a number of different ways if they had known about this they could have used this to their advantage so let me give you an example of the kind of understanding that i am think uh, you know understanding of funds that i'm thinking about so there was a time when under poshan abhiyan they used to be uh, or maybe there still is not entirely clear uh 2% of the total funds allocated as flexi funds so these are untied funds that are given to the states to meet their local needs and within this 2% less than 1% is allocated as a uh, award related funds and the other is the innovation grant so if abc impact had been known about this kind of funding that's available and they were sure of their pilot and they could have actually you know used their pilot and pitched it to the state as something that could be covered through this innovation grant now this innovation grant is something that is earmarked solely for the development and implementation of pilot programs like exactly tailor made for what abc impact wanted to do and so if the state is able the district is able to identify this uh successful pilot program they can actually use this uh innovation grant funding to actually carry it through and these funds are allocated at the state level but the and the state then decides how it's distributed to the districts and then it's up to the district how they want to spend it so if abc impact had pitched their work in this way they could have aligned themselves with the district's need to actually spend this innovation grant and at the same time also fulfill their capacity building needs right in a more sustainable way now the now they don't have to go to external funders in order to fund it they can do so through the funds that are available within the government system itself and also you know help fulfill the government's own need to actually show expenditure under this category uh this is something that chakshu roy had also highlighted again in the second panel um that nothing happens without the budget right if if you're just going to pitch a program the question is also always going to be like how do we do it like we don't have the funds to do this you can pitch something extremely interesting but you have to show where can you get the funds in order to actually do it um so i mean thinking about all, the way that all of these different levels work right abc impact first went to the topmost level to the joint secretary to the union level and 
that's that's our understanding right now of how things work right policy making and policy changes and you know governance reform is seen as something that takes place at the very highest levels of the system right that the highest levels make the policy and then all the levels below work on implementing it but now if we think about this from the principles of decentralization and how we've discussed how the power is now distributed across all the various levels you know with this in mind we can actually try to identify points across the different levels of the system that can actually act as catalysts for making policy and you know implementation change so let's go back now to the first big organogram uh, system map that i had shown and uh, now that if we reflect back to the various challenges you can see that through the different stages of their work abc impact had to interact with so many different levels and departments right they talked to the joint secretary they went to the state level they went to the directorate the health and education departments they went to the district collectors and the various functionaries at the sub district levels who were the most key in actually you know taking their capacity building program forward and and uh, like as i'm showing this map like let's I, it's important to not just get lost in this entire you know big administrative maze but when you do go to the ground or you are trying to pitch a program what's important to know is who is responsible for what and what kind of change can they actually initiate right what power do they have it could be informal power or like formal authority but not just that but can someone can they actually be held accountable for that decision or the action that they take later right so i'm going to leave you with that question these questions of accountability right if they have the power they have the authority they have the funds and the functions how can they be held accountable right so let's look at it one from a uh, pitch one question from the perspective of a beneficiary if you're a beneficiary and you haven't got your nutrition related services who do you hold accountable right now you're looking at it the map from the bottom up looking up as a beneficiary who do you hold accountable then the other way around and this is a problem that actual functionaries really face on a day to day basis say you're within the system and uh, you are feeling overburdened and who who do you go to who do you go to when you face a challenge right and with these kinds of questions there are currently no clear answers but one way to think about these questions of accountability is to actually try to examine and disentangle this decentralized system of governance you know examine once again where does the power lie and try to trace the interactions across these various administrative systems uh um i hope that like going through these uh, challenges that this our fictional abc impact has faced can show you how these uh decentralized systems are implemented how they play out on the ground and what are the different ways and angles with which you can view it and try to disentangle it in order to obtain your objective um so that was my last sort of point to leave you with the questions on accountability and i'll um hand it back to rajika um to wrap up the discussion as we're end, uh, nearing the end of our master class um uh, rajika yeah thanks sanjana uh, we are actually running about 10 to 15 minutes late so i doubt we'll have any time for questions um and so uh, and so we won't go over time but what i am going to do is uh, instead of taking you through all my slides uh, what i'll do is i want to take you through to my last slide um uh, so actually no hang on we can go to the first slide quickly uh, and i just want to quickly reiterate the, some of the points that sanjana was making uh, that like you know these are exact things that i was talking about earlier lack of clarity ends up making a, 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 a you know a, makes a big difference you need to know like who does what where how who has money to spend where how uh, how much money do they have spent uh, who is accountable to what uh, how are different uh, how is the community uh, uh, how is the Uh, the local government or the government accountable to the community and how are they accountable to higher levels of government one needs to understand what are the competing power structures so when we speak about the parallel lines we also need to remember those parallel lines could just be line departments it could also be autonomous bodies it could also be different other organizations and it could also be levels of government and um and one really important part is who has the autonomy to take decisions so guidelines are a great way to start and i think that is very very important to know where to go who to go to how to go to yeah, by looking at guidelines but it is important to go further delve into into disentangling this further uh, 
by just looking and learning from people because it is a, a social organization at some level we can move to the next level next slide um so i just wanted to remember these challenges that abc impact had these are some of the things that we also talk about in decentralization theory and we talk about um uh, uh, we 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 talk about how to decentralize well and you know when someone asks me what is the def difference between decentralization and devolution devolution is a kind of or a way of decentralizing and when you devolve power it really means that you have given all power to the local level so it's not just that the pri it's not just on paper so for example in india one can say that like decentralization for a great extent political decentralization has been successful we have a local formal local tier of uh, government governance but at some level it's not been um, at some level it has been slow and diluted because the power at the local level is also fairly diluted and you will see that at different levels of the government and so that's really important to understand that as you go disentangling the system you will find that there are complications in this web in different uh, parts and phases and power gets collected in different parts and uh, uh, and and levels and so what i want to say is that i'm not advocating for just decentralization to happen and that we should decentralize to the local level but i want to advocate for uh, for looking out for uh, uh, for stronger intergovernment relationships and like i said in the beginning that play out on um, each other's strength that you know you you play on the strength of the comparative advantage of one level over the other so state over local uh, uh, over uh, district over um, um, block over village which area which which level of government would be best suited for what uh, not in terms of just ngos engaging or csos engaging with the government but also in terms of csos um, um, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, government uh, assigning functions and work at, at what level moving to the next slide i want to leave you with a framework i i you know it's a quick session that we've had we definitely don't have time for questions but if you can go to the next slide sanjana so i want to leave you with a little bit of a framework to think it about think about it so next time you go and disentangle any any sort of local function whether it's nutrition whether it is uh, health whether it is agriculture go and look for clear functional assignments are the are, you know are the guidelines clear on who has to do what because these clear functional assignments uh, of you know uh, which department does what exactly uh, which level of government does what exactly will lead to clear roles and responsibilities the first part of my diagram uh which hopefully will lead to direct and clear accountability because we know what we have to do the uh, brc the, the local level frontline functionaries the ashas the anganwadi workers the panchayat sarpanch etc they know what they have to do and what they are accountable to now second step once they have been given the function you also have to give make sure that there is a fiscal envelope for them a finance so fiscal decentralization is important and it's important to have the rules of fiscal decentralization clear so you know the money can't come delayed the if you have been given the task of uh, weighing machines then the weighing machines need to um then you also need to give the give the asha uh, the anganwadi worker resources to use the weighing machines and so there needs to be a clear, clear fiscal envelope finally there needs to be also a competency building system within the government right like and this this leads me to somewhat administrative decentralization in a way that are the functionaries there do we have the competency and when i say competency building framework i don't mean capacity building equal to training i also mean using technology i also mean making sure that there are they are not overburdened the work that has been given to different levels levels are not overburdened with work right there are competent and there are uh, uh adequate and ample resources available at every level to do uh, what they have been assigned to do and finally i think that these three things if you go in with a framework for with and you start looking for these things you will also need to look at what the accountability system looks like because if well devolved well decentralized system uh, uh, like a system like this you see then you will also see that there is accountability not just from the people to the local governments but also the local governments to the higher level of governments and simultaneously even the higher level of governments are accountable to the people and this accountability is really important to see so what are the grievance redressal mechanisms who do i go to if there is a problem should i go to the sarpanch should i go to the anganwadi worker or should i go to the asha worker and then my problems get lost in this jumble of uh, power asymmetries and information asymmetry and people don't know what they're doing right so so all of this is really really collected and we believe that this 
lens can be a great way of looking at disentangling systems and structures and this is what has actually helped us in our own research in trying to create these organograms and so this can finally lead to better services we hope um, local and uh, local taxes probably will go up uh, better disclosure consultation participation and hopefully it will lead to better accountability and so this is what i want to leave you with it is a little bit ideal idealistic it is a little bit simplistic but it can pose as a starting point to to starting to untangle or detangle this uh, web of decentralization in or decentralized governance in india today so thank you very much mm -hmm.